Can you hear me in the back? Is it okay? Is it on? Hello. Yes. It is. <coughs> All right. So thanks for showing up. This um, photo is from DrupalCon Munich when we just started our small company. Um, and ever since, we like to be a little bit ahead of the herd. And to prove, well, this is me and my colleagues. I'm the one with the, with the belt. So, um, and this is DrupalCon Prague 2013. We're wearing this green shirt, and I think you can see us. And it became our mission to hijack group photos with our T-shirts. Uh, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail a little bit, like this year. We're too far in the back, but uh, we thought we had a perfect spot. <laughs> All grouped together, and then we failed. Anyway, this is part of our team, and although we are a web agency, we still find business cards of great value because they're easy to exchange, they last a while when you hand them out, and it gives you something to talk about when you give them to someone else. Take this subtle brow on the back, for example. It reads Limoen Groen. This is our business name. It's Dutch for lime green. Um, but it's enough for a visually disabled person to Google our name and then find our contact information. But mainly, it's a good, uh, um, a good way to start a conversation about accessibility and why we find it important. So I brought a stack of, uh, with me on this, this table. Feel free to grab one after my talk. Hello. Hello. This place everywhere. So Limoen Groen, it's a, we are a Drupal expert based in Amsterdam, a three minute walk from the central station. And we focus on building, delivering websites that last. Like the websites that we build should last at least five years. Um, but they should also be, be, be used by everyone, regardless disability, device, place or location. So in my, in my talk, I will talk about why we chose a specific niche, a specific um, goal, like our tagline, sustainable websites. So my name is Boris Wanskes. I'm, I have a few hats on, but I'm also I'm the chair of the Dutch Rupa Foundation. I co-own Limon Groen, I'm the founder. Um, but originally, I'm a front-end developer, and I write Drupal code, Drupal code now and then. So I, I wrote some, I think I maintained some 15 or 20 modules. Uh, I've written some Drupal core patches. Uh, mainly accessibility-related issues. So, for example, if you are familiar with, with the Bartek theme in Drupal 8, uh, the Bartek team, uh, every link in Bartek has an underline. That's one of the patches I worked on. Of, or the, the button you can see in the CK editor uh, was released in 8.2, and it gives you an option to select a piece of text and then mark the piece as, uh, as text in another language. So if you quote, like, a French poem, it will pronounce, the screen reader will pronounce that piece of text in French instead of English. <clears throat> so we started the company in, in 2011, five years ago. Uh, and when I started Limon Groen, I was thinking about a name. Like, I needed a name that stood out from all the competitors that we had. And I, want, I wanted a name that people can remember, that was a bit catchy. So I started by looking at the competitors. And at the time, we had the Drupal.nl website. It lists, like, all the Drupal agencies or... Um, uh, companies in the Netherlands and Belgium. We had like 103 companies on this list. So I started looking at the names, but also at the taglines, like what are they doing? And if you look at the taglines, you see, you see examples like, we are a full service internet bureau. We do internet solutions. We do online media. We have built fil functional websites or Drupal web development, Drupal engineers. I see five times the words Drupal specialist. And then the company names, really technical, like Latin, Niche, uh, Intracto, Indicia, Ocio, uh, difficult names to remember uh, for a client. So, and I was thinking like, okay, but which are company names that, that you can easily remember or are fun or, or nice? So I was thinking about names like, I liked Apple, for example, or as a company in England, Bright Lemon, catchy name. And there's a design agency in Amsterdam with a, with a German name, Achtung, and it's, it's written in capital, so it's like, Achtung! And I like the name. Um, so I started thinking, so how can I distinct myself from competitors? And I started looking for a name that contains like a fruit, like Apple does, or do something with green, making sustainable websites is what we do. So, and then I came up with Limon Groen, and the alliteration is nice, it's like Limon Groen, it sounds good. Uh, and people can remember. Um, but I also like businesses who spoke, uh, who spoke out about one thing that they were great at, like, working in a specific niche or saying like we are the best in this type of question that you have. So I have some examples. 
for example, Four Kitchens is a company that makes big websites. They're very bold at it, like it's just their tagline, we make big websites. But if a client like needs a, a solution provider to, to create their huge uh, company website, they might approach Four Kitchens because they tell their experience with making big websites. Or e-commerce solutions, commerce guys, because they are saying like we are the e-commerce provider in the world. That's basically what they're saying. Someone who wants to do a Drupal project in e-commerce probably will go to commerce guys. There's companies focusing on performance and optimization. Two bits is one of them. For performance problems, tuning, you probably might want to give two bits a call since you know it's the, th the only thing they do. So they should probably know what it is. There's companies focusing on uh, Drupal data migration. It's a small company, this, and it's Migrate Rocks. It's, it's run by Chicks. Some of you might know him, Drupal developer. Why are you laughing? So, yeah, yeah but, but he's, a, he's the migration expert. He did a, done a lot for Drupal uh, 8 core uh, regarding migration, and he started the company doing Drupal data migration. It's the only thing they do. So, but apart from doing these um, uh, type of technical things that you focus on, you could also pick like a, a niche of a market. So for example, Mustard Seed Media, uh, they focus on building websites for churches and ministries. And that's, if you go to their website, that's the only thing basically they do. And they have a lot of examples and portfolios for websites for ministries for churches. Uh, there's a company in Canada, Origin Design. They focus on websites for ski resorts. And it sounds like a very small niche, but in Canada, there's a lot of ski resorts and sports agencies. And they have a huge list of client names and, and, and very known one as well. So it might be useful to, to pick a niche to, to excel in. Um, and then you could, of course, start a company or rebrand a company to do one niche or one technique. Uh, but there are also examples of companies that do like a split, split off. I'm not sure if that's the English word, but they decide, okay, uh, it, it would be too much of a hassle to do and this niche plus the, the usual project, project, projects that we do. So for example, Gogorilla, a Dutch company, they do a lot of Drupal projects in different markets and then they want to excel in a social uh, uh, internet. So they launched Open Social as a, as a, a specific uh, company. It's their own offers, their own branding, their own marketing budgets, uh, just like basically two companies. Uh, Taco, one of the owners once told me, like. Google Gorilla still uses Skype for communication and uh, Open Social, which is basically the same team members, but they use Slack for communication. And the, the, both companies have their own ways of communicating, setting up their processes. And that can be a way too. So um, before I started my own company, uh, 2011, I worked at the Capgemini Group, which is, it's called in, in Holland, uh, the, the, they have two, two brands, Capgemini and Society. Uh, but Society is part of the Capgemini Group, and you probably know that name. And it's a huge organization, and we created mainly websites for governments. And, and there at the job, I learned a lot about accessibility. At the time, we built a website called webrichlijnen.nl. And webrichlijnen is, was basically the Dutch version of the WCHG, WCAG. Um, so it needs to contain like all the information regarding accessibility and all the rules and how, how you can apply, uh, how you can... Um, Validate your website? Yeah, Frank, no, a little bit. Well, anyway, so all the rules and regulations around accessibility in the Netherlands, you can find the information on that website. So that website should, of course, be fully accessible. Uh, and for this project, I learned a lot about accessibility. So then when I started, when I left Society, I kept Jim and I, and, and started my own company, I thought, well, since we know a lot about accessibility, it wouldn't be wise to, to excel in this and focus on, on accessible, accessible websites. So yeah, uh, Limu Groen was born. Uh, green for sustainability, a line because I wanted the fruit in the name. So, yeah. Uh, this is uh, the office opening half a year ago. It's our third office in five years' time. Um, we are with 14 people now and a lot of friends. It's not, it's not our full team. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but let's get back to the topic. It's choosing a niche to focus on. And in our case, sustainability, accessibility. Hey, Dan? Yeah. <laughs> You have a bright lemon. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no. uh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, we need to, to throw the table chair, table table away. What's it called? Ping pong table? Ping pong table. We have to, to, to 
put it, to throw it away since uh, we're out of place now. <laughs> it's the last spot where we can move some, uh, some, some desks in. Um, so we found that, mm, that a lot of websites are fully rebuilt. Like every two or three years, companies dis decide that they need a new website. And then they find out that, well, the, the current website that we have is not good enough to build upon. So we have to, you know, the development agency will say, well, we have to do a new website. We can use now new, maybe a new version of Drupal or maybe another system. Then we have to do a content migration. And it basically happens every two to three years. And that's, I think, a waste of time uh, and energy. Um, basically a shame, I would say. And the way we use this um, is we pitch at, 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 a, at, a, at a pitch, we, we tell clients, like, you know, a website is basically like, it's a bit cheesy, but you know, when a baby is born, you know, it's just the start of something nice, and, and you have to, to give it love and attention for years, and it's never finished. So going live with a website is just a moment in time, and it needs continuous love and care and uh, improving so we always have like an SLA with the, with the website and we, we have some you know, a few hours per week, a few hours per month to keep updating the website and make it easier and better because the company, the client grows and the website should, should, should be able to grow with the client. So we focus on making the websites easy to extend, easy to maintain by asking questions during the development process like, okay, dear client, you asked me to integrate this system in such and such a way but what happens if like, you're gonna change to another system in two years time? Shouldn't we like, make it a little bit more, I don't know, we can develop it in another way, it takes a little bit more time now, but makes it easier to connect to another system in two years time? Or, dear client, you're asking us to do the website in Dutch only, but you know, we would love to, to do it good, knowing that you might want to expand in a few years time. So let, let us just build a website in English, translate it to Dutch, it's for Drupal 7. So we are able to switch to English, or to, to French, or to whatever language in a few years' time. And there's everything that we develop, we're asking these but questions, like what happens in two years' time, what happens in three years' time. But then we also want that all the websites that we, are, that we build are accessible by default. It's just not something that a client has to ask for, or that we have to sell as an add-on, like, hey, there's SEO improvements, hey, there's accessibility improvements, no. It's just the websites that we build should be accessible, should be able, everyone should be able to use it. Uh, people who are blind, people who aren't able to use a mouse, for example. Because um, it's a funny thing, if you go to, I think maybe 50% of the websites and ignore your mouse or your pointing device and try just using the website via your tap, uh, your, your keyboard, so most websites fail miserably. You have these very nice, big drop-down menus uh, that only expand when you hover with your mouse over the links. But if you use your tap because you're not able to use a mouse, they just don't expand. You never can get to the, those links. That's an example. So every drop-down menu that we built should be tested using keyboard, for example. So, you know, sounds good, right? But why should a client <coughs> want this? Why should they pay for this? Because we are not the cheapest development agency in the Netherlands, they can choose another one who's cheaper. And I try to sell this in a way by comparing accessibility with responsive design. So it's a way to reach a wider audience, you know, you, when you support desktop and mobile. Uh, no, sorry, uh, I'm skipping a slide now. Pull back. So the, the accessibility as added value is a way to, to tell clients like, you know, there is a huge audience that that have a handicap, a form of a handicap. Uh, there's a number on the screen, 25% of all people have a handicap. And it sounds ridiculous, but this is a result of a, a report done by Microsoft in the Netherlands, stating that there's 25% of us having like visually disabled, blind, low literacy, colorblind, um, people have, have trouble reading difficult languages, uh, difficult texts. And if you sum this all up, it's 25%. It's like four million Dutch people having trouble using the internet on a daily basis. So if you make your website accessible, you can reach a wider audience and sell your products easier, make it uh, better for them to buy a ticket or to buy whatever you do on your website, give your information to a wider range of audience. And by building websites in an accessible way, it's also a way to score much better on Google. Like Google is basically a screen reader, it's a blind user, it cannot see your image, it cannot see your video. But if you have like an alternative text on an image, very simple example, 
that's a requirement for accessibility, like a screen reader can explain to a blind person, hey, this is an image of Minister X shaking hands with, I don't know, uh, President I. And by explaining in an alternative text for the screen reader what the image is about, Google can index the text as well. So someone who's looking on Google for President X shaking hands with Minister I will find your website because all you, you improved the accessibility of your website. So yeah, and it's just the right thing to do, I would say. But. So I then compare it with responsive design. It's basically, a few years ago, it was perfectly fine to say, and I can remember this, like coming at a client and say, well, you know, we know our clients and they will never use a mobile device on our website, so make it desktop only. Or why would people even buy plane tickets or buy a car on a mobile device? That's ridiculous. Our website does indeed a responsive version. And then you had like a period of few years times where we say, Yes, but you know, the home page would be nice to have responsive, but maybe this part of the website, the forum, it's fine if it's desktop only, and that happened. Uh, I think that we as development agencies or as clients should not decide whether to hide certain parts of the website. I've had work on projects where the home page had like a huge, I don't know, slideshow with all the information on it, and then people decide, oh, for a mobile device, we can just display none of the slideshow because we don't have space for it. And then I would say, yeah, well, you are deciding that your mobile visitors should not have access to this information. It's ridiculous. It's, and that you don't want to do that for screen readers as well. Uh, or you can just turn the question the other way around. Like, if, you are, if it's okay to hide this information for mobile users, why would you bother sharing this information with your desktop users? I'll throw it away anyway. If you start uh, implementing um, accessibility from the start of a project, it's not even that much more work. It's, it's quite easy to do. And that goes the same for responsive design. If you start responsive design from the start, it's pretty easy to, to make the every page like work on, on every screen size. But if you have to do responsive design after the website is, uh, the, the project is done, it's very expensive and very difficult. And the same goes for accessibility. If, if you start on your last sprint, start working on accessibility, uh, it will take a lot of energy and time. So with just a little bit more effort, you gain a lot of profit. And making the website accessible and responsive from the start makes it easier to update, makes it easier to grow in the future, lowering the total cost of ownership. <coughs> so yeah, um, we try to excel in a niche for accessibility, for sustainability. My belief is that if you want, to, um, if you want your clients to find you for a thing, make sure that there is a niche that you want to excel in. Um, and by just being another Drupal specialist, won't win you extra clients. That's what I would say. So build websites that last, can be used by everyone. And everyone will love you for that. Take a card if you want. And before we leave. I, yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it's very subtle, yeah. Uh, yeah, let, yeah, let's do some questions if you have some, if time. No? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I wonder if you've had uh, a lot of public sector clients approach you about the new EU directive and making their sites either retrospectively compliant or new ones that should be. Too little. I, w I was hoping to have more clients uh, approaching me, but it doesn't really happen so far. I think it's, uh, uh, they still don't feel the pain or that the need to, to adhere to these uh, regulations. I think it's um, because it's down to the individual member states to apply it. I don't think many, many people actually know where they stand at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, from my sort of public sector side, my, I'm less concerned about my Drupal site's accessibility and more about the legacy systems uh -huh. because of the need to actually put on our sites if we don't comply and where. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, we, we've had uh, regulations in the Netherlands stating that government websites must uh, be accessible since 2006, I believe. I'm looking at Frank now. But there's never been any charges if you don't. It's like, you should. But if someone doesn't do it, it's like, okay. It's basically. I think with the new EU di directive, I think we're basically waiting for a couple of really high-profile cases 
through the courts, a uh, couple of nice big fines for companies. And only then, I think, it will become imperative for companies uh, internally to say, you know, we have to comply. We have to be accessible. Um, but uh, thankfully, it's becoming law, so we can actually have these cases in court. Hi. Uh, I wonder how are you actually approaching a client, you know, like when they say they want to go in accessibility and they're interested in, but um, I mean, if you look at all the accessibility guidelines, I mean, uh, sometimes it feels like it could go forever, you know, so to improve a site, to make yeah. it more accessible, yeah. and to get like the highest rating and highest uh, points. But uh, you know, it's like when you know, it's like um, a client wants to start on it. Well, how do you actually offer that? I mean, do you have different scenarios, like a basic package or something? You know, it's like how do you structure it? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, what we basically do, there's a lot of rules and, and, and tests to, mm. to, to, uh, to implement. Um, we do the quick wins during the project. So our websites are not like 100% accessible, I, I dare to say. Um, but we know uh, what's needed to do so. So most of the websites that we build are just pretty accessible. Um, you know, they have the proper heading structure. They can be used by a keyboard. Um, once in a while, we even test with real screen reader software or have a blind person coming over and test the websites that we build. Mm -hmm. um, but if a website really needs to be like fully accessible and tested, we charge extra days for it because it just takes more time. Uh, and okay. it's roughly about two, two days that we calculate for, uh, for, for making, uh, um, getting to the standards. So basically everything that you can include, you know, it's like uh, in the process that you do and uh, everything on top would be yeah, yep. in yeah, package basically. form. And it depends, of course, on the on the, the, the functionality and the features that they require. Like, yeah. there are some red flags. Of, obviously, if they want video, it's a red flag. Like, there's so many of these things that we show up. Oh, dear client, you want to apply to the standards, and you're talking about one video on your website. Like, can we some think of another solution? Mm -hmm. uh, makes it much easier. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Welcome. Excuse me. I didn't quite grasp. Uh, how you lower the total cost of ownership, if you can go back to that. Sure. Uh, oh, the question was how, how would accessibility lower the total cost of ownership? Uh, and I would say uh, same goes there for uh, responsive design. If you have a proper website that is uh, accessible and responsive, it's much easier to apply updates in the future and you don't have to to uh, every new feature, uh, have to redo all the work that you've done before. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I'm not sure how to, to answer this question. Yet, I think. Let's discuss uh, after the session. Yeah. Good one. Um, I guess we can all agree that it's the right thing to do. Uh, but if you had someone who wanted, you know, more hard statistics about, I don't know, uh, reaching more conversions or less calls to customer service and something like that, do you have any cases on that? I don't. No, no, but yeah, I don't. Which one? Which one? Perfect. I think you can like the process. You can relate the process to like Bing and Google has been the best studies like uh, one tenth of a second uh, increase in the speed of your website mm. and uh, that is like three or four percent yeah, extra uh, sales on that page. So I think the same goes for, for um, accessibility. I mean if twenty five percent of your population has some sort of One more thing to say about this is that Google started, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, websites that are not responsive, they will get a lower 
uh, ranking in Google since a year or so. And yesterday I was told that Google will start doing the same for accessible, for inaccessible websites. But if your website is not accessible, I'm not sure how they test it automatically. Uh, but you will get a lower ranking than websites that are accessible. So it's another incentive to make your website accessible. Uh, I think I want to conclude with uh, pointing you at the sprints on Friday. Uh, if you haven't been to one, you don't have to be a developer. We need people to test, document, to discuss about accessibility. There is an accessibility sprint table. Uh, the Drupal 8 core lead is there as well, Andrew. Uh, so please join. Please come over to the table and ask what you can do for the community. Uh, there will be tutor, uh, mentors uh, helping you if you never tested like a patch before or you have no idea how to, to do that. Please come over. It's uh, really fun to, uh, to attend. <coughs> and um, I'm always looking for feedback. So if you want to tell me and tell the Drupal Association how I did, please rank my session. Thank you very much. that you were here. <laughs>